today. Lord, we, we thank you for this space, for this moment, for this time that we can seek your face. And we ask, Holy Spirit, come have your way today in us. Just repeat this after me, church family. You can just say, Holy Spirit, come have your way in me. Come move through my worship. Come move through the prayers on my lips. Come, Holy Spirit. We give you this time, God. We give you this time. I pray right now as you quiet any, any loud thing that would try to quench your voice today. God, would you quiet any fearful mentalities that would try to bake their way into our praise, into our worship. Lord, we come here to set our gaze on you. We come here to fix our eyes on you. The author and the perfecter of our faith. God, you've done it all from beginning to end. You forged a covenant with us by your blood. You've come and revealed yourself to us. You've come and into our world by sending your very son. You've come into our hearts by sending the spirit of God in us. Today, Holy Spirit, we cry out, Abba, Father, thank you that we've been adopted into your family. And we worship you today as sons and daughters. Father God, come and meet us today as we seek you and we worship you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to come to the front as we worship the Lord. I feel he just, he wants us to worship him as a father this morning. We are his children. And so we come joyfully, expectantly, running into his arms, knowing he's good and rejoicing over his mercy and his grace. Let's worship him.
Thank you, Jesus. Right now we're distributing the communion elements. If you don't have them, just raise your hand. Make sure people, the ushers, as they come around now. As we're, we're singing and worshiping the Lord this morning in this these words, we thank you for breaking the bread of your body. Spilling the wine of your blood. Communion is the celebration of this new covenant. We should not take it lightly, but we should enter in in reverence and fear of the Lord. It's we take this moment to remember what was done for us 2,000 years ago when the Lord himself had taken on flesh walked among us and then freely laid down his life. It wasn't a covenant with the blood of sheep and goats. But this was to be an everlasting covenant. No longer a type and shadow because Christ was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice. We read in Revelation that there was none found worthy. John fell to the ground weeping because there were none found worthy. And then the angel said, there's one. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah who sacrificed his own life to bring us into this covenant. So as we get ready to receive Make no mistake about it, this is not an ordinary communion. We are remembering the Lord's death until he returns. If there's any sick among you, just bring everything before the throne right now. Because there's power in the blood to heal, to save, to deliver, to set you free from any entanglement of the enemy, any of the sins that so easily beset us. There's power in the blood. want to receive for I receive from the Lord that which I also deliver to you that the Lord Jesus on the very same night in which he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread, let's break it together, and let's receive. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup 
is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's receive this as the very blood of Jesus. Can we say, can we take it up with that verse? Thank you for breaking the bread of your body. Let's take a moment just to sing this. Close your eyes. Contemplate on it. Sing it to the Lord with your heart.
Yes, can we give God a high praise right now for the spiritual birth that he's done? He's given us a spiritual birth. He's birthed us into his kingdom. There is such joy in the spiritual birth of Christ. Let us give him high praise right now. Give him high praise with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength, everything that is in you. Give him high praise. What a gift, what a gift, what a gift. He's brought us into his marvelous, glorious light. 
God, catch us up in your story. History. His story. The entire creation has one purpose. It's for His pleasure we were created. When you read earthly history, you, it talks about kingdoms rising and falling. And, but the revelation of Jesus, which was from the very beginning, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Genesis is the beginning of history, his story. And his purpose for you and me and everyone you see to come back into relationship, communion with the Father. You're a part of that story. I'm a part of that story. All that have gone before us, all that will come after us, it's part of His story. So God, catch us up in your story. God, help us to have a bigger vision Help us not to be myopic or caught up. Not being able to see the forest for the trees, as they say. But just, God, give us that 10,000-foot overview. Where we can see the end from the beginning, even as you are the, the Alpha and the Omega. God, that we might see as you see. That we live our lives from your perspective and not an earthly perspective. God, that we store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. God, that lasts for eternity. Give us eternal eyes, God, to see. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence here. God's opening up eyes today. He's going to give you greater vision because you're part of a story. You're not stuck. Those are lies of the enemy. You're not stuck. God has written a story about you. He's written all your days in his book before there was even yet one of them. You will walk in the fullness of the destiny he's called you. Just say yes, God. I agree with you, Lord, and he will unfold it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just give the Lord a, a hand clap and a shout. Come on. He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. We worship you. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Turn around and give somebody a high five and say, God's writing a story over your life. The end has not yet been told.
Yeah. He took his position. I was like, all right, Zeke. I was like, I'm like, I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. So. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was good. More Lord. All right, if we could find our way to our seats. Amen. Amen. Well, I have a few announcements. We have some new announcements this morning as well. Uh, but first, we'd like to welcome any first-time visitors. If you're here for the first time, can you just give us a wave? Any first-timers, just wave. Welcome, welcome. Can we give it up for them? All right. Life Center, that was a little sad. Can we welcome our first time? <laughs> All right, if you leave your hand up a little bit, the uh, ushers are coming around. There's a coffee card gift for you that will give you free co uh, coffee at the Art Cafe. But there's also a Connect card. So if you take some time to fill out that Connect card, uh, at the end of the service, you could drop it in the black box on the way out. That'll give us information about you, you information about us, and we can connect that way. All right? For those of you who are going on the outreach, that's going to happen at 2 p.m. today. 2 p.m. today, Harvest Outreach. We're going to go evangelize in New York City with Mirley and Sherwin. Are they somewhere? They're somewhere. Last night was incredible. The team's going to the Philippines. If you missed last night, well, ask somebody about it. There we go. I got to get Colt up here. All right, Dr. Mercurio is going to be with us. They're going to put a slide up there. He's teaching a class for our singles and those that are dating or maybe even those that are engaged. But it's navigating physical intimacy and purity while single and dating. So it's going to be Friday, March 22nd from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. We do need a head count so if you can scan to register. He's amazing. He's spoken here on Sunday. He's done many classes for us. And he is um, he's a professor. He's a licensed sex therapist. He's a believer. And so he's got some important things for us to hear and to learn. So come on out to that. And for those who have not joined us, or maybe you don't know, we have prayer throughout the week. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 12 to 2, we're praying here in person and on Zoom. So you can join us, uh, like I said, in person or on Zoom, whether it's the whole two hours or for a few minutes of that. We would love to have you be a part of that. And our men, we are gathering two, uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. That's this coming Tuesday at 7 p.m. We'll be gathering here. So guys, come on out for that. And then this is something that's new. We have a prophetic ministry now here at Life Center. And so on the third Friday of the month, before our Encounter God service, we have uh, prophetic booths where you could sign up by appointment, and we're going to edify, encourage you, and pray for you uh, in some side rooms over here in the back. So if you want more information on that, you can come and see me, or you can scan that QR code, and you can sign up, and you'll, you'll get an email about, hey, this is what to expect, all right? But again, any questions on that, come, come ask me. I'd love to let you know. This is another new announcement. Our very own Pastor Bill and Tammy are going to be leading a class, a marriage class. And the title and the theme is Do Not Let Anger Undermine Your Relationship. That's pretty good. All right? We might need that. Amen. <laughs> so it's April 1st is the start. April Fool's Day. You'll be a fool not to join. Yeah. Thank you. The first service didn't get it. <laughs> Appreciate that. But seriously, sign up. Sign up. It's going to be five weeks, and it's, it's going to be amazing equipping, and this is something that's invaluable. So if you're married and you want to join and be a part, go ahead and scan that QR code, and you can uh, be a part and sign up for that class. All right, I'm going to invite Coralie to come on up. As she's coming up, she's going to be receiving the offering today. So there is a number on the screen. If you need an envelope, raise your hand, and then she's going to give us some instruction. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome to church, and I hope you experience God's love today, and also that Jesus' love is just blowing you over today. Um, I, this is a time to give, and here is the number you can message or do online, and our ushers also have um, the, the card, so if you, or I'm um, sorry, envelope, so if you need an envelope, please just raise your hand and they will distribu distribute the envelopes. 
As I was preparing for today, um, I was led to two kings, and he talks about this king Josiah, that he became king at the age of eight. <laughs> I don't think it's always a blessing to become a king at eight. Um, but as he was, um, it starts off with saying, um, you must celebrate the Passover, Passover to the Lord your God as required in the book of the covenant. So what happened was, um, there was a few, Ezekiah was king and then there was a few evil kings. They forgot about um, all of God's law, all of his instructions. They then discover it and brought it to the king. He read it. He felt like a deep repentance. And in this book, he's doing a chapter of like repenting for this, removing this idols, removing this. And, um, and then he's like, oh, but we also have to do the good things, the Passover. And it says, uh, and he was preparing for Passover. And it says about him, never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart, all his soul, and all his strength, obeying the laws of Moses. And there was never a king like him since. And this is such a highlight. That when we give, it's not just about giving money. It's also giving everything, like your heart, your soul, your strength. And then going that further of obeying everything. So I know finances is one thing, time is one thing, but he gave everything. But it doesn't stop there. There's something else we also need to give to God. The next verse is, even so, the Lord was very angry with Judah because of the wicked things Manasseh has done to provoke him. This was a king a few generations before. As we give everything to God, there's going to be things that's coming up where there's also hurts, which you, a brother might have done to you, a parent, a grandparent, where you found out like a few generations before there was wealth and they wasted it all away. So as we're preparing for Passover, I go to God and give him your heart, your soul, your strength, your obedience. But if there's anything coming up, be that person that also say to God, oh, my friend didn't know what they were doing. Forgive them. My, my, I had great parents, but there is sometimes things that come up. Then just give that over to God as well and ask God to forgive them because they didn't know what they did. Because we don't just want to be a Josiah, but we want to be like a Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah, there was such a bigger breakthrough. Um, but let me just pray for us in, in this point. So, Lord, I pray that we are like King Josiah. That we would turn to you with all our heart, our soul, our strength, our time, our money, our provision. God, that we will also be people that obey your laws. Yes, Lord. And if there's anything that came up from a previous generation or anything that anyone done to us, that we would also give that over to you and get your heart for the situation, God. Amen. And in this point, I would like to invite Colt over that's bringing the message. So yes, just raise your hand if you want um, to fill in your envelope. Um, so God, I just thank you for someone that's sold out with their heart, their mind, with all their strength and in obedience to you. And I thank you, God, for your spirit of revelation that's in this room, not just for cult, but for each one of us to hear what you're saying and that the spirit is going, Holy Spirit, is behind us to bring us to repentance and also bring us to revelation. Amen. Thank you, Corley. I'm going to pray one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for what you've already deposited in our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and increase. Come and increase revelation. Come and in increase experiential knowledge of your love today. God, we, would you break down anything in our, any barrier in our heart, in our mind, any barrier in our relationships, any barrier in how we think and how we act and how we live, Father, that 
wanting more of you would be the sole focus of our lives. Lord, delighting in you, giving our life fully to you. For, Father, you have given your life fully to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so it's good to be with you all this morning. I'm going to be talking about the life of Daniel. So Rich unpacked this amazingly last week. This is going to be a part two, and then next week is going to be a part three that Rich is going to keep digging in. So for those who missed part one, I highly recommend it. Go back, look, check it out on Spotify or podcast or what have you. But I'm going to really play off of what Lich, uh, what Lich, sorry, Rich, the... <laughs> I'm slurred after all the amazing uh, worship today. <laughs> uh, Rich read a great foundation, and I want to I build off of it. So, um, so we're going to be talking about how do you thrive in Babylon? How, how, how does one actually thrive um, in the context that Daniel, um, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that they were thrust into? And just to give a little um, backtrack of the story, right, these are young men, right, the, they're 13 to 17 years of age, and they get plopped out of their nation, right? They have the invaders come in from Babylon, take them from Jerusalem or wherever they were in that region, and place them in right to the heart of a culture that is corrupt and wicked. And not only that, they are called to be trained in the king's court. So they're being raised up in the midst of magicians and all sorts of sorcery. And, and Nebuchadnezzar is the head of Babylon at that time. And he wants to take these boys and turn them into his minions, right? He wants them, he wants to take everything that they have in their life, every talent and gift, and use it for his kingdom. But the problem that he ran into is that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they had all already had some sort of foundation in God. There was an understanding already in their heart, and their parents likely laid this groundwork that their God and his kingdom was an everlasting kingdom. It was a greater kingdom, and God was to be feared and honored at all cost. And so these boys are sent to this foreign land but this has already been deposited in their hearts. I want to tell you, parents, I hope this stirs your heart. Even go to this marriage class. Get your family on a solid footing that your children will be ready for Babylon. And Babylon will actually be scared of them versus them scared of it. Because we're raising a generation, it's not just the little ones, it's all of us, that can go into Babylon and challenge the forces and not be shaped by it, but actually shape it. That's what we're after. That's what we're pursuing. That's what I want to talk about today. How do you shape Babylon instead of it shaping you? Now, too often, I think we find, um, just in the modern-day examples of this, people are kind of on one of two spectrums. You, you either are, you look so much like the world that it's hard to even tell you apart from them, and you're not actually influencing the world, right? You're so in it that you, you've lost your very sense of identity. You've lost your, your recognition that you actually live from a different kingdom, that you're citizens of heaven. And so maybe you have a heart for the people in Babylon, but you've become indoctrinated, if you will, with the culture of Babylon. Now, on the flip side, we have those, we are so consecrated, we are so set apart that we're not even involved, right? We're, we're not even in, in the lives of, of the people and the hurting and the broken. And, and that is a real reality. So we want to be somewhere in the middle of that. We want to be consecrated. We want to be set apart. But we want to be, and if you're in New York City, God has placed you in the midst of a city that, as Rich described, has some Babylonian tendencies. We're not going to call it that. We're not going to prophesy that. But it's got some tendencies. It's a different culture. It's not a kingdom culture. But you've been placed there to influence it, to, to be salt and light. And so that means you have to be in it, but it also means you have to live like a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so for me, where the rubber meets the road with Daniel, with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, with, all, with these four young men, they had revelation knowledge of God before they even got in there. I'm pretty sure that the text sort of leads you to think that. But they needed more than that. They needed more than their personal revelation, even their, what the foundation their family had given them. Because as Rich pointed out, there is other young men that are in this group that did not walk the same path, live the same life, have the same impact as these four did. So what was it? What else did they need? I want to convince you today that I think the thing they had and the thing each and every one of us need is they had covenant relationships. They were in a covenant community with one another. 
And that is what carried them through and allowed them to actually run the race and not be manipulated and not be indoctrinated and not be corrupted by the culture they were in. I really believe the scriptures speak to that, and that's what we're going to speak about today. So I think one thing to keep in mind is the whole idea of covenant. It's a very foreign concept, unfortunately, in the modern era. If you think of covenant, maybe you've heard it as it relates to marriage. And even our covenants of marriage, right, 50% of them fail in, in the Western world. And, and so it doesn't really give you a clear picture of what a covenant really is. Um, so I want to just unpack a bit. What, what even is a covenant? Like, what do we mean by it? And what do we mean by being a covenant keeper? So a covenant, um, the meaning is really, it's a commitment. So just think of it as simply a commitment of anger intermingling between two parties. All right? But it's more than that. These two parties are coming together to make a contract, an agreement, a promise with stipulations, privileges, responsibilities. It's, but it is legally binding. Now, hear me out. When we say the word contract, you think, ah, like it's like a legal thing. But a covenant with God, it's contractual, it's binding, but it's based on love. It's kind of a beautiful picture, right? It's, got, it, it's not based on how you feel. But the whole thing is rooted in love, and it's binding. You can't break it. That's the way a marriage is supposed to be. It's sacred. It's holy. It's we are not going to break this no matter what. And we love each other. We're doing it out of love. But the contract is firmer than my feelings, than my emotions, even than my own actions. That is what I'm describing in terms of covenant. Covenant is the, it's the storyline of all the scriptures. And it actually means, um, the Hebrew word is actually to cut. Um, it, it would be cutting of animals, right? So you think of the covenant that God forges with Abraham. They cut an animal in the middle and they walk through it. And, and this is the defining point of the entire Bible, certainly of the book of Genesis. From this point on, the whole book, chapter 12, everything changes when God cuts, cuts a covenant with Abraham. And so it's sealed by the blood, in that case, the blood of animals, but in the new covenant, it's sealed by the blood of the lamb, the lamb who is Christ, our, our sacrificial lamb. And so through his blood, the deal is sealed, and we are, our, our, our communion with Christ and with God and with the Holy Spirit is completely bought and paid for by the blood of the lamb. I need you to hear that for me today. Because even as we're talking about covenants, we're going to talk about Daniel and some of the Old Testament types of covenants. We are living in a new covenant. And this is very different from a covenant even that you would make in marriage. Because in marriage, I'm going to say, hey, hey, Vanessa, here's what I'm bringing to the table. That's my wife. And she's going to say, here's what I'm bringing to the table. And we're going to make an agreement together. But in a covenant with God, God says, I'm initiating. Here are the stipulations. I'm doing everything from start to finish and you're just coming along for the ride. Your job is to say, yes, I believe you. I have faith. I receive your grace. And, and, and now I'm yours and you're mine, even though you initiated and did everything, God. And I just simply said yes. So it's different than two parties, right? One's unilateral and the other is bilateral. With God, he starts it, he initiates it, and he finishes it. And that's what we, we talked about today when taking communion. So God forms a covenant with man. We see this with Abraham. We see this with David. We see this with Noah. And, of course, we see this with Christ himself, a covenant cut for your and my sins. So Daniel, just going back to Daniel, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, starting in verse 4. Daniel 9, verse 4. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you're going to hear me say all four of them because I, I want, it's a communal, it's a covenant relationship that I want to highlight today. So they understood this covenant-keeping God. And if you don't understand a, that God's covenant-keeping power, the nature of God, he's not a man that he should lie, not a son of man that he should change his mind. When he speaks, he acts, and when he promises, he fulfills it. That is very rare in the world we live in today. Probably even your best, closest friends, they will say things sometimes and not do them. It's so hard to imitate that type of covenantal power and assurance. But let me tell you, when you read the word of God and God says he's going to do something, 
just underline it, highlight it, scribble beside it. Because let me tell you, that will come to pass. Many of those words have already come to pass. There's so much prophecy that we can take confidence in because God already said he would do it and he already did it. But then there's loads more that we need to have faith that he will do. But let me tell you, he's not a man that he should lie. He will fulfill every promise in his word. And he's actually called us to know the covenant keeping God and be covenant keepers ourselves with each other. So Daniel chapter nine, starting at verse four, here's how Daniel prays. Now he's praying, he's getting revelation. Oh my gosh, the 70 years are up. Isaiah prophesied, they're getting out of Babylon, but he's provoked to pray in accordance with the revelation that he has from the word. But here's how he prays. Here's how, listen to how he addresses God. I prayed to the Lord my God and I confessed Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to the servants, the prophets. You spoke, to, you spoke in the name of our kings and our princes and our ancestors and to all the people of the land. He's wearied by the lack of obedience of the Jewish people. It, it wearies his heart, but he reminds himself and reminds God, oh, you are a covenant-keeping God. You're true to your word. You said it'd be 70 years, so it will be. We're in Babylon, things feel a little crazy. No, like I know that there's a timing and that God is going to do what he said he would do. Some of you need to hear that today. You're, you're in situations, you're, whether it's with your job or with your family, but God said certain things. His word says certain things, and you can bank on that. And you need brothers and sisters that will point you to this word. They won't just say, go get it. You're amazing, like, which is fine. Like, I, I, I'll take some encouragement. But they'll encourage you with the word, with the things that you can build your life on that are true, that are right, that are good. And, and, and so that's, we receive that in our covenant relationship with God, but we're called to model that in covenant with one another. I think the world does not understand, nor see, nor perceive the type of covenant relationships that the church are called to convey. And I would dare say we don't know it either. I, I believe God wants to, this whole house is built on covenant relationships. This church does not exist if there are not covenant relationships. Men and women of God, Bill and Tammy, Sal and Jules, who are praying and contending and in covenant with one another. And I would dare say, I believe it is a, this church is called to be a prototype of what family looks like, of what covenant looks like within the body of Christ. Lord, let it be said that we can model this just even in a little bit of a way. Because the world will take note, because this does not exist in the world. Because it's supernatural, the ability to have a, a, a covenant relationship where you lay your life down for one another. You don't do that naturally. The human flesh does not do that without the Spirit of God demanding it and the person of God agreeing with it. So let's go to Daniel. Daniel, if you turn to Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, they have the context. He's the covenant keeping God. We know his, his ways are true. We can trust him. But now they're in Babylon. And I can imagine them at like the first, I'm going to play this out, the, the, the magician's meeting, right? And like you got all the young men and they're telling, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. You're going to eat this. You're going to eat that. And these, these boys, like, we don't know if they even knew each other. They said they were all from the tribe of Judah, but who knows what they actually, how they, the tribe of Judah is a big tribe. So just kind of like, you imagine like looking ac across and like saying, okay, who here is going to bend and who's not going to eat the king's delicacies? Like who here is going to take a stand and believe what their parents taught them and believe that the God they encountered as a child is stronger and bigger and his kingdom is everlasting? Who's going to do it? And I can just imagine them like locking eyes with, with one another. Like, he's not going to take the meat. He's, he's not going to take the bait. He's not going to agree with this culture. And, and we need that in this city. All, some of you already know the people. You've, you've locked eyes with them. You've, you've connected with their heart in some measure. And they're the ones that are going to keep you on course in the midst of Babylon. You need those people. And if you don't have them... I want to tell you, you might have been worshiping beside them this morning. You didn't even know it. 
they might be in this room and you didn't even know it. The first time I came to this church, I worshiped beside Jordan Dennett. And Bill was like, turn to your neighbor and pray for him. And, and I got to pray for that man. I was like, this is a man of God. I went to his conference the next day. He had a Father's Heart conference. Why not? And, but Jordan, there's a man of God who I know I can go through the trenches with. Like, there's a man of God who we, there's a covenant between us that we are going to fight for one another till the end. And we're going to hold each other. We're going to hold each other to account of the things that God has said, of the very calling and nature of God to be exuded in our life. So you never know who you're worshiping beside. So Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. But Daniel resolved he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. And therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. This scripture just tells us that Daniel said this. But we read in a few verses later, Daniel 1, verse 12, that Actually, Daniel now says, test all of your servants. Test me, test Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We're all doing the Daniel fast. They shouldn't call it the Daniel fast. They should call it the Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego fast, even though it's really hard to say and really long. But that's the reality. This is a fast that wasn't just done by Daniel. It was done by a community, a covenant community. They did it together. And so even though it says he set his heart to do it, maybe they were like, we're with you. Let's do it. And the four of them did it. And if you read Daniel 1, verse 15, it says, at the end of those 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in the flesh. Praise God. They were fat, even though they ate all these veggies. Um, <laughs> then all the youth who ate the king's food. So the steward took away the food and, they, and the wine they were to drink, and he gave them vegetables. And as for these four youths, it says all four. As for these four youths, God gave them learning, skill, and all literature, and wisdom. And Daniel, specifically, had understanding in all visions and dreams. So catch that. Four of them all had wisdom. They all, in literature, they all had skill and learning from the Lord. Why? I think because they fasted together. The scriptures seem to be saying that because they set themselves apart. But Daniel, specifically, had a gift of understanding visions and dreams. So let's keep going in Daniel chapter 2. We're just going to skip down a bit. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 17. And, and this is when Daniel, um, Nebuchadnezzar, and Rich talked about it last week. Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he's like, it's a crazy dream. And he's like, hey, all the magicians, like, I, only, I, don't, I want not only the interpretation, I want the details. And they're like, how can one do this? This is crazy. And Daniel says, buy us time. Give me some time. So he goes home, and I want you to catch the first thing he does when he gets home, right? Nobody else knows this but him and whoever was out in the court that day. Then Daniel went to his house. And by the way, the, they're going to kill all the magicians if they can't figure out the king's dream. That's the context. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known. And this is Shadrach, Meshach, and Migdal. These are Jewish names. His companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. Seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now, you've probably read this a ton of times, but I want you to catch something. Daniel had the interpretation, but Daniel did not see it fit to go home and seek the Lord by himself. The first thing he did was he went to his friends, to his covenant community, and he said, Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill us. Pray to the God of mercy. And I would presume, based on the evidence of uh, these men and their character and their integrity, they probably fasted and prayed all night long. Now, it's not very hard to fast all night long. I do it every night. But <laughs> pray all night long because your life depends on it. And then Daniel, the one who they said was gifted with dreams and visions, boom, he gets the dream and the vision, and he struts in there knowing God is made away. But the whole thing was not about just Daniel. It was the whole covenant community. Who are those people in your life? When, when Babylon comes knocking, they have a demand, and you feel the pressure and the weight. Who can you call 
and they will contend and pray for the God of mercy to come and help you through that trial, to come and help you to be salt and light, to be the, the man and woman of God he's called you to be in this city. If you don't have those people, you need those people. You desperately need those people. I'll say it again. You need those people in your life. And some are going to be older and some are going to be peers, but you, you need a collective of covenant community. You won't do, you won't fulfill the things God has for you if you don't have it. And I say that with all seriousness. Like, you won't, because this is how God has designed it. And I love in this community, you even see today, we got people all, we got young and old, we're all up here. We're up here, everybody's dancing. I, I don't care, you know, what age you are. Like, it's a beautiful thing. It's a rare thing, that the diversity we have in age, in, in, in demographic, and in all of it here. This is a beautiful thing. So while you're in this city, while you're in this season, get those covenant keepers around you. And I would ask you this. Who in your life can you be that for or have you been that for or do you need to be that for? Looking for it for yourself but also saying, who, who am I going to, I'm going to be their armor bearer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray them through. I, I'm going to, who has, and they might have gifts and talents that you don't have, right? Not all of them had what Daniel had, but they could pray. But they were, in, they were in a covenant relationship with him, and they could carry him through. So who, who, is, who are you called to be that for others? Now, there's this interesting thing. I've been reading through um, the early church's baptism practices. It's super interesting, you guys. I'm, like, nerding out over it. So we're talking, like, 3rd to 5th century A.D. This is the early church. The church has only been around a couple hundred years. And, and what they found, and they found this through through um, archaeology, actually, from actually seeing the baptismals in these old churches in North Africa, different places. So baptism, it was a whole process. It wasn't just a one type of moment thing. In the early church, you might be in a baptism class for a year, and then on, on you know, Easter Sunday, that's when, like, the moment takes place. But there was a whole drawn-out process. And the, the whole, the process was experiential. It was rich with, with teaching, with instruction, but also with imagery so that you knew you were entering in from a totally dead old life and you were coming into a, as a new creation. You were being reborn. And so the way that they would do that is you would, you, you'd first of all, like you would go into this, like they would anoint your entire body. <laughs> like, so before you went in the baptism tank, your whole body would be anointed and, and, and they would pray, they, they would pray out the demons because, and people get freaked out by that, but not around here, but other circles, they're like, what? They did exorcisms in the early church? I was like, yes, and we should today. You can tell I'm charismatic. So, but they would, they would pray and you'd renounce all the powers of darkness right then, right then in the baptism tank. Because the truth is, there's a whole kingdom that was ascending on you. You were, you were becoming brand new. You were washed by the blood and regenerated. And, and so I'm not going to recommend this next part, but they would, you'd be totally naked when you get to the baptism tank. So they would, you would be stripped off because you're like a baby now. You're a new creation, boy. It's like the garden. We're back. We're back in Genesis 1. And you would go in the tank, and you would come out totally naked, and they'd put a white robe over you. But not only that, now that you've gone through this process, now that you've envisioned and felt and experienced all these things, you're being embraced and welcomed into an entire family of God. You got delivered out of darkness. You got delivered out of whatever the heck you were in. And you're not only coming as a new creation on the inside, now your relational dynamic has completely changed. You're now adopted into a family. So God is a father, but if he's a father, who are your brothers and sisters? And so this whole process was meant to bring you into the royal priesthood that you are now a part of in Christ. Covenant relationships. I wanna make a few quick points about covenant communities before I close. Covenant communities build spiritual rhythms that challenge, provoke, and strengthen your heart. These rhythms, they're not non, they're non negotiables. Like, in the early church, they recognized you can't be a Christian if you're not fasting and praying. You will get taken out. Like, you will not. I think sometimes in the West, we get so, like, 
we're so unaware of spirit, the spiritual powers that war against us. And New York, it's a little less because it's a little more obvious at times. <laughs> but in general, it's like if you realize you were at war, like, and we're born into war, right? When you signed up for, the, for, for God and his kingdom, all of a sudden all the powers of darkness are now coming against you. And talk to some people that got baptized here recently. They will tell you, oh, shoot, like this is no joke. Like the powers of hell are coming at me. But praise God that he is faithful to deliver me. But you're in a war, and it changes how you live. It changes how you think. And if you know you're in a war, you're going to operate, and you're going to do these spiritual disciplines. You're going to pray. You're going to fast. You're going to submit yourself to whatever it takes to stay humble, to stay connected, and, and to stay in his heart, in his presence. Because you know God has a purpose and plan for your life. Like we were saying that you know you're meant to come against every stronghold, every bit of darkness. You're meant to be salt and light. And the only way you can do that is you have to live differently than the rest of the Babylonians. If you're not living differently, you can't be salt and light. It's not going to happen. And if you don't have people around you that are praying and fasting and that are reading the word and that are encouraging you in it, good luck. Seriously, good luck. Like, you're not going to have impact in this city. You will not. You may get to a certain level, but you won't be able to bring the kingdom of God to the people that need God so desperately. But when you have that community, it helps you to not, instead of like trying to make yourself pray more, make yourself fast more, ugh, who's got grace to do it? All right, who here has grace? You, this guy, man, this guy, he can pray, he can fast. Let me get around him and see how he does it because and maybe he'll pray for me. Maybe I can start to model and, sh and be shaped by him so I know how to do it with grace and with love and be connected to the Father instead of just trying to buckle up and do it on my own. When you do that, it produces religion. But when you do it in community, it produces a spiritual rhythm that connects you with God's heart. It's totally different. And I really think the community is where you actually find that sort of spirit of religion is broken. More of that, Lord. Do it, God. <laughs> Covenant communities, they form spiritual rhythms in the midst of Babylon. Covenant communities, they own the problems around them. See, if you're just on your own and you're on an island in this city, you're going to be overwhelmed. Like, let's just be honest. There's just too much in your life to handle. Like, you can't handle just even the daily assault from your boss who's like a Nebuchadnezzar, right? That just, like, zaps you. Like, like get, get, God, help me. Like, so you spend all your energy and time praying for Nebuchadnezzar, and you have nothing else to give, right? And some of you are like, man, that, that's me. Um, but when you're in a covenant community of people that can get around you and pray around you, then it, it, it disperses, like, the need, right? And, and you're able to, with these people, take more ground, but also think completely differently. You're, you're able to actually address the, the heart issues of the city, of the people, because you're doing it as a collective, as a group. And, and I just feel there's something about when you're in numbers praying and fasting, when you're in numbers bringing like revelation, understanding of the, the issues and the needs of the city, you begin to get outside of your own world. You begin to think bigger. You begin to think more globally, more kingdom oriented. And in that place, we will meet the needs of the city. We will meet the needs of the Nebuchadnezzars because we're not just trying to just like play block and tackle. We're actually like collectively getting a vision for what God wants to do and say, God, would you meet the need of my company? Would you meet the need of my family? Would you demonstrate your power in my life? And so there's something about corporately when we begin to do that, we begin to contend in a way there's just an ease in it. Does that make sense? It's almost like an exponential ease that takes place when you're praying together and it allows you to, to solve problems as opposed to being overwhelmed by them. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse, starting at verse 2. And this is Daniel praying a bit earlier in the chapter. It says, In the first year of, the, of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet and the desolation of Jerusalem, that it would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord, and I pleaded with him in prayer, in petition, in fasting, in sackcloth, and ashes. He knew God was doing something in his day and age. He knew it prophetically from the word. And then he positioned his heart to be a part of it through intercession and through prayer. 
God is doing something in this generation, in this city, but unless you're in community, you'll miss it. You'll be fighting Nebuchadnezzar. You'll be, you'll be thinking about how do, how do I get up the chain? You'll miss it because he's doing something globally, and this city has global impact. So God's placed you here to do much greater things. Daniel saw the word of the Lord. He prayed the word of the Lord, and I believe he brought others into this narrative that we wouldn't get caught up in our little worlds, but we would be aware of his kingdom and in advancing. Lastly, covenant communities prioritize unity. It's in the word community. How could you not prioritize it? Unity. So for those of you that are like, you're like hardcore evangelists, and I love you, and there's so many more of you coming, and it's fantastic. But I was talking to Lachlan about this. Like the evangelist, like sometimes doesn't recognize the need for even corporate gatherings and like any unity and heart connect because you burn for the world but you don't realize the world needs the church to burn. When the church burns, then the world will see and the world will take note. So keep going, keep pushing, push us, push the walls of the church out. I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying there's something about when you have a unified body, it will accomplish the goal that you're pursuing on the streets. It will work faster and harder and more efficiently and better than you trying to do it on your own. And take, take Daniel for an example. So you have, right, Nebuchadnezzar, who's the greatest king um, at the time, right? He's, he's got the most power of anybody in the world. And, and this guy is just crazy beyond crazy. He's killing everybody. He's like taking over nations. And these four young boys, like teenagers, they come into his court. And as Rich talked about last week, it was the worst decision he ever made. And so these four boys, because of their unity, because of their agreement, right? They won't, they won't pray to his God. Um, they refuse to eat his food, and, and they, they just, at every turn, when he wants to direct them in, in his ways, they'll honor and love him in, in certain ways, right? They'll do a good job, but they'll refuse to, to bow their religious, and their hearts will stay connected to the Lord in everything they do. So in all of this, Nebuchadnezzar, this is the dude who set up a statue, by the way, a gold statue, and he called the nations to it, and he said, everybody bow down to this statue and worship it. And the nations did because he's Nebuchadnezzar. They bowed down. These four guys repulsed, re repelled him in every way and listened to how they turned the king's heart. This is Daniel chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Listen to this letter that Nebuchadnezzar writes to the nations, the very nations that bowed before his gold statue. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages, that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the most high God has done for me. This is a man of many gods. This is a man who, who literally names these young boys after his other gods, and now he's proclaiming to the world, there's a most high God. These boys have modeled something to him that have shifted his heart in such a manner that now he knows our God, Yahweh, our God is the most high. And he's writing this to the nations. How great are your signs, how mighty your wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures from generation to generation. The mightiest man in all of the earth got a revelation from God from a unity of four teenage boys. Their unity, their covenant, produced a mighty demonstration of God's love and a proclamation of the gospel at that time, a proclamation of who the King of Kings and Lord of Lords really was. Do not underplay the ability of your covenant relationships to shift things in this city. There are kings and people of high influence, and you think, oh, what? I'm 20-some years old. What can I do? These guys are 14. I'm 16 years old. What can I do? Seek the Lord in covenant relationships. It will turn the hearts of kings. It may turn nations. It, because you're pointing them to him, and it, you don't need to have all this experience. You just have to have a heart that says yes. Clearly, these men were able to do it as teenagers. Worship team, because you guys come up for me. I just, as we close, I want to... I want to encourage you 
to pursue covenant community. And for some of you, that may be kind of um, something that feels a little, a little different. Um, so I'll tell you personally, when I, when I came to the faith, I was 18 years old, and I was a spiritual orphan in a sense, in that I had an encounter with God that was super powerful, and I gave my life to him. I was, I was all in for Jesus. But I did not have covenant family around me, kind of like the, the early church model. I wasn't born into a family. And so in a sense, I was like a spiritual orphan in that my heart was crying, Abba, Father. I knew God in some sense, but I had no family. I had no family to raise me. And some of you, you you've been in this, in this position, right? You're newer to the faith, or maybe you've been in the faith for some time. You had an encounter with God that was real, that was tangible. But God wants to bring you into covenant community, covenant relationship, where you can grow and learn how to be a son and a daughter, learn how to, how to thrive in his kingdom, how to thrive in the midst of Babylon. I'm telling you, like, there is, it will shift your entire, it'll, it'll shift your entire spiritual journey when you get in covenant community with other believers. But it will scare the heck out of you. It requires vulnerability. It requires you trusting other people with your heart. And when you've had patterns and rhythms and people around you, especially in Babylon, right, you can see, find people, they say one thing and they do another. You can read the headlines about, you know, fake Christians and bad churches and all. You can read all that stuff and you can let it get in your head and say, I'm out. I'm just going to do it on my own and have no influence, honestly. And have, and have, or you can say, you know what, God? I want to grow, and I know it comes through covenant community. I know you've, you've, you have baptized me into a family, and I'm going to put my heart on the table and trust you because this is how you designed it. The body of Christ was made to be a family, and I'm going to give myself to it. If you will do that, if you will trust this community, if you will trust the, the people in this community with, with your heart, you will be useful for the Lord in this city. And, and you will come alive. You, you will find things break off. In, in my group of friends, so I, I got around friends in college, um, we would, I didn't know how to do life. I didn't know how to do community together. They'd come to me and confess these deep, these like sins. And I was like, cool, dude. Like, hope you, you know, hope you work that out. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to be vulnerable. Like, I don't know why you just told me that. Just keep it to yourself and deal with it. But then the Holy Spirit's like, no, like, this is what you don't know. You, you don't know family like this. You don't know spiritual family. You don't know covenant. You need to confess your sins to him. Like, that guy? Like, he's really messed up. Yes, confess your sins to him because you're hiding stuff too. We got to do the James 5 thing. We got to confess our sins to one another. We may be healed, that we, that we may be restored, and ultimately that we may see God, the covenant keeper. You will see him. You will see his forgiveness and his mercy. You will experience his love through the eyes and through the hands, through the touch, through the emotions of your friends and your family, your covenant keepers. That's where he's experienced. So you'll get touched here on a Sunday, and it will happen. He'll come and just touch you. But you're meant to give it away, and you're actually going to receive it through other people. You know, you can experience God. I've experienced the love of God at times, not even through worship, but actually through somebody coming and forgiving me somebody coming and caring for me, somebody coming and laying their hands on me. Oh my gosh, I feel the Lord's love. It's flowing through you. It's flowing through your words. It, it's flowing through how you think about me. It's, it's flowing, flowing through your thoughts. Could everybody stand for me, please? Father, I pray you would help us in this season, God. Lord, would you help us? We need help. Some of us, we don't know how to do this. We really don't know how to have these type of relationships. God, we don't know how to, how to bring people in. So I pray for grace this morning. Give us grace to bring people in to our lives, to our hearts. God, help us to trust again. Lord, let's be a grace today to trust again, to trust you by trusting the body of Christ. Lord, let there be a, Lord, I pray you would run out all fear, all intimidation, God. I, I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you unite us e even in prayer, God, that I, I do feel, and I said this in the first service, that an action call I would give to you 
right now, actually, everybody should close their eyes for one sec. Holy Spirit, maybe you already are, I forget what I said. So, Holy Spirit, I pray right now, Lord, would you show each and every one of us, show us covenant type of relationships in our life. Show us people that are going to model your love, that are going to model your heart. People that we are called to run with and are called to run with us. Holy Spirit, would you highlight those key people. People in your family, people in your work, people right in this community in your church, people in your ministry. God, I pray you would show us these individuals. Help us, God, give us the grace to be honest, to be vulnerable, to pray together, to war together, to support and care for one another the way that you, Jesus, have modeled to us. And I want to encourage you, as you're seeing those people, you need to take a step towards them. You need to be intentional in how you approach them. And some of them you need to do communion with. It is a weekly communion. You need to get on the phone, find space, find time. Oh, my job's crazy. There's all these things going on. Exactly. That's why you need covenant community, so that you can engage in his heart, so that you can get out of the kingdom of darkness and step into the kingdom of light. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so ministry team you guys can come on up I know we're, we're running over if you gotta get going feel free to go um, we would love to pray with you so even as we go back into worship our team is here we want to pray specifically um, against isolation honestly we, we want to pray even grace over your heart to, to re-engage with the body and we want to pray that you will thrive in every place that God has, has put you Just one more quick thing. If you need healing, we'd also love to pray for you. And we've got a word of knowledge specifically about the healing of, of hands. So if there's something pertaining to your hands specifically, just let our prayer ministry team know if you're coming up for healing so that we can pray for you. Um, but healing of the hands is a specific word, so come let us know. Bless you guys if you have to go. Have a great, have a great Sunday.